You're listening to the Clean Comedy Podcast with your host, James Creviston. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Clean Comedy Podcast. Today is a comedian friend of mine. We met in a uh, writing group that we're in. Robert G. G. Lee, you guys have heard me talk about this group a lot of times. I meet a lot of great people there. Uh, probably some of the smartest comedians I've ever met uh, come out of this group. And they're, you, you'll understand why I say that in a minute. Um, my guest today is a comedian, a voiceover actor, MC, podcast host. He's performed at clubs, contests, corporate events, churches, fundraisers, festivals all across the country. He also has voiced shows like on PBS Kids. And he's done Lifetime uh, Movie Network movies as a serial killer at on the same stage uh, the same studio at the same on the same day. So he's been a good guy on like a PBS kid show and then a serial killer. Same day, same thing. Wild. And he's also the co-host of a podcast called Clean Comedy Time, which I have never been on. I don't know why. So I'm going to ask him that question while we're on this podcast. But please welcome the very funny, the very talented Brian Atkinson. Welcome, Brian. Ah, uh, the smartest comedians you know. And then there's me. No, you you are definitely one one of them for sure. You you and June, besides Robert, obviously, who also right. we, we had the class together on a pod, like on a podcast. We could talk yeah. about all the funny things Robert has said to all of us. Sure, but between you and June, I get like probably the best feedback um, possible on on jokes and stuff. And well, so that I, is exceptionally kind of you to say. Thank you so much, James. I, I'm going to let you know, though, I did a open mic to the other day. It was to, to, to get a spot to open for Levity Live. So Levity Live out here is yeah. in, improv, like the improv, but it's their like side club. You can't really work your way in there. They don't really have open mics, but they have a contest. And I just wanted to see like how I'm working on new jokes. And I think I, I worked. Oh, I did the joke, um, the watching TV joke, like how uh-huh. I have to sneak TV that we all talked about. I did that joke <clears> and. I still am refining it a little bit, but I got third place out of, you know, 20 or so comedians for that because of, of your help. So that I, I really, that's what I'm saying. It really is being surrounded by the smartest people that you, that you can know. So. That's awesome. Um, one of my favorite things that Robert Geely has ever said, he said this in a, in a class setting and I did take, I was in the first class he did for, you know, learning how to do stand up and things like that. And I've been doing it a few years already, but. I thought his class was great. And so plugging his class, you can find it on Facebook and stuff like that. He, mm-hmm. he promotes it and sign up for it and take it. But um, one of the things he said that I thought was terrific was, um, there's two, I have two things, two, two things. Right. The first one is remember that uh, your material is a frog, not a baby because nobody gets upset if you dissect a frog. Right. And if you think of it like a baby, you're going to be upset every time you pick it apart. So that's thing one. Thing two is um let's see what was that other thing <laughs> he says a lot of stuff though it'll come back to you in the middle of the podcast watch. does it will it's gonna come back it's gonna <laughs> come back to me and uh yeah and then i'll remember it uh but that yeah the 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 frog and baby thing is something that it it absolutely changed the way i approached yep. writing comedy it changed the way that i worked with other comics and even things like that and sometimes if i'm at a club and I'm talking with another comic and I say, Hey, do you mind if I give you something that I thought of when you were performing? And they're like, Oh yeah, sure. I said, now just remember your material is a frog, not a baby. Right. <laughs> and that, that made, uh, that helps because people are like, Oh yeah. And I, I think that's, that's just wise to always remember it like that. Oh yeah. Especially like when you're a new comedian, you hold on to a joke. You like, you write this joke. You think like, Oh, I love this joke. It's an amazing yeah. joke. And, and, yeah. and when somebody like gives you advice or tells you something, you go, well, that's my, I, I wrote it yep. this way for me. And you like, you get so defensive. <laughs> that's like, no, you can't, you can't be defensive. And actually the right. best comedians go, oh, you know what? That's a good point. Like I remember yeah. doing the, doing the clean comedy challenge and having Robert G. Lee sit across from me and give me feedback on these jokes. I still have the recordings on my phone. And I'll listen to them from time to time. And it's just like, okay, yeah, I'm glad I listened. Like, and I could tell every single time I got on stage after that, I got a little bit better and a little bit better. because. But there were people that I know didn't take the notes. They were like, Psh, you know, what's yeah. you know what I'm talking about? It's my yeah. joke. I wrote it, so I know what I'm doing. And I remember the second thing. Yes, yes. <laughs> the second thing is um, you might not be good at stand-up. You might be good at writing. You might be good at marketing. 
you might be good at, I mean, there's a whole host of things in and around comedy. And part of the class he did was kind of talk through, here are some jobs that are not doing stand-up, but that are stand-up adjacent comedy related. Yep. And, and some people find that, oh man, I always get so nervous on stage. I'm like, why, why are you trying to be on stage? Yeah. I mean, if you, if it's something you want to overcome, great, wonderful. Uh, stand up will make you overcome it or you'll, you know, go down in flames. <laughs> But if your gift is writing, maybe do more of that and and punch up jokes for other people and and you find out that you get good at it and turn yeah. into a writing career. And it's a it's a money maker. Writing writing jokes is is a big. I mean, there one of my one of my mentors coming up was Gene Perret, who wrote for Bob Hope for many years. That was his. He was never a stand up. He was never mm-hmm. any of that stuff. But he wrote jokes, and so he's one of the greatest joke writers ever very proficient man taught me how to write jokes and that helped me out in the long run. So, I mean, I, I like to pick from a lot of people. So Brian, how did you start in stand up? What was your, what was your, what was your origin story? Cause I'm, there could be a lot of ways in, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to answer that question, but there's two things, <laughs> two more things that I. this wanna... is why, this is why I like hanging out with Brian, by the way, just yeah. so you guys know this. Is, okay. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> two, two more things because there's a question you asked in my intro and then something that I thought of when I was uh, watching and listening to a previous episode. Okay. Previous episode with Glenn Tickle. I love Glenn. First of all, I thought I was the only person who had ever seen Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension and was grieving the lack of Against the World Crime League <laughs> until I watched your episode with him. And then I'm like, okay, I need to find out who Glenn Tickle is and <laughs> figure that out. Um, yeah, like I have a, a DVD copy, not, not a Blu-ray copy. A DVD copy, and why? Because I wore out my VHS copy. That's <laughs> why. Yeah. So that that movie is just just my age. Uh, I was uh, like senior year of high school, freshman year of college when that movie came out. So that's a big deal. So I just wanted to connect back to a previous episode. If you haven't seen the episode with Glenn Tickle, pause this, go back, watch it, then come back, and we'll talk to you some more. Yeah. So the other, <laughs> I love this. The second thing you asked is, why have you not been a guest on the Clean Comedy Time podcast? I was just kidding. It was a total no, 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 joke. No, no, no. I <laughs> want to answer it because um, uh, uh, almost a year ago, we stopped making it. Oh. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the guy I was partnered with, uh, Aaron Sorrells, has uh, leapt into the metaverse. Mm. And so he's got the Soapstone Comedy Club there. Very proud of him. Very proud of the work that he's been doing there. Uh, so he's got a virtual reality comedy club. Uh, it's clean comedy all the time. Um, and that's what he's doing. And he has been marketing himself since we started comedy about the same time as wow. the unemployed alcoholic. And now he's un- not unemployed. He's un- unemployed. And I think he just needs to write in a little un in front of it and he'll be fine. But that'd be yeah, funny to figure that out. But um, I am uh, now clean comedy time is just me. Yeah. Uh, and I'm contemplating bringing it back. And I'll make you this deal. If. I bring it back. You will be my first guest. Oh, well, that dude, I yeah. would love that. That would be awesome. Yeah, we'll yeah, there we go. And we'll do All this right. conversation in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. it doesn't matter what conversation we have. We have yeah. fun in the conversation. So it yeah. doesn't matter. That's what we're going to um, do. So, so you let, asked, let's hear your you origin. Asked, how did I get yeah. started? This is my origin story. Um, so uh, when I was a little kid, there was this um, commercial for legs pantyhose. And In it, the little kid points out his mommy and says something, and it's embarrassing. And um, my family went to church, and one Sunday morning, it was my mother's turn to go and read the Holy Scriptures. And on her way up the middle aisle, and I'm sitting on the aisle, and in my high boy soprano voice at seven years old, I shouted out the line from the commercial that went, that's my mommy, the one with the wrinkly pantyhose. <laughs> and it killed. <laughs> uh, whole congregation exploded in laughter. Not my mom. Yeah, of course not. No. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that bit killed. And then when I got home, she killed me. Yeah, of um, course. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. So it was like that early. I was like, oh, so. Age seven, some people call it the the age of permanence. You you remember more things from the age of yep. seven than you you don't necessarily remember a whole lot before that. And not that people don't remember anything, but 
at seven, you're like, oh, okay, this is this is life. This is what's going on, and uh, and you remember more stuff. So that's that's a very early memory for me, and a very visceral memory of hearing a room full of people laugh. Yeah. And so my very first experience in comedy was, you know, a couple hundred people in a church setting, and it and it, yeah, just crushed. I really loved it. Um, is that funny because most most comedians <laughs> if they have that moment in early it's yeah. uh it's a causing trouble type moment it's not like a sure. like you know it was just like you're yeah. you're want you just want to get something out and you think it's so funny in your mind so you just say it and then a yeah. group full of people all laugh at you and not and then nine times out of ten you get in trouble for it. like i did that yeah. in school where i would say funny stuff and kids would laugh and then i would get in trouble and i was like okay yeah, right. but but the reaction <laughs> right the laughter was so much Right. better than the than the punishment so it was like well i'm just gonna keep doing this like yeah. why not <laughs> well i just watched john mulaney's new netflix special. i haven't watched it yet okay yeah uh, I'm well it. so you go ahead though <laughs> this is not a spoiler because as soon as you turn it on the first thing out of his mouth like before the opening credits is i'll be fine if i get enough attention <laughs> and i was like john we're <laughs> that's yeah. just it is i mean if you're not an attention seeking whore <laughs> yeah <laughs> why Don't are you convenient. doing stand up <laughs> why would you do this uh so i don't understand that um uh when was then, your like official of uh, your first like official time yeah. on stage like stand up stand up type stuff well yeah so to get there there's a, okay. a little tangled road uh through okay. radio i worked on the radio i got started in high school and um and and then out of high school and and other places and i was in it for a number of years and at one point i was um in a town and they're like oh you're a local radio personality we do a comedy night why don't you come and host it like mm. sure and i had kind of always wanted to do stand-up comedy but i had never right you know, i didn't know where to go or what to do or anything and all of a sudden i'm like here run this show and i i wasn't running the show i just show up and you know, talk to the people for a little bit and introduce the acts. And yeah, and I loved it. I had fun. I did some voices. I did some some bits, um, but nothing I really wrote down and thought through and used comedic structures and, and things to get there. Just, you know, what I thought was funny. Fast forward a few years, I'm, I'm out of radio. I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, I worked my way down to minimum wage doing that, which was painful. <laughs> but... but um, uh, a few years ago on my 50th birthday, my wife gave me Steve Martin's masterclass. So you take this online masterclass, it's all recorded, but there's a community aspect as well. And I started going through it and I kind of got through the tools portion of it and was like, I can totally do this. And I kind of came out of one of the sessions that I'd been listening to right in this very room and, and going through it. And I said to her, I said, okay, so first of all, thank you. Second, I'm so appreciative that you, you know, give this to me, uh, but I am going to figure out how to start doing this and it's your fault. <laughs> so, so I get to blame her, which is nice. Um, I, um, uh, here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, we have a wonderful comedy festival. It has, it got, uh, kneecapped during, uh, COVID, um, pretty badly. But uh, this just this last um, last month in March, uh, it's in March every year. Um, they got it back to I don't know about half strength, maybe. Okay, used to be like a two week festival and so on, and this was just just under a week, and so it's it's coming back. And um, they had a thing called the first timer showcase, and I like oh well I'll sign up, and I so you, I filled out a little web form, and you know you've never done it before. Nope, it's the first time. There you go, signed up. And uh, and they accepted me. And then so I had to so, huh, I should write some material. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and I had I had, you know, you know, outlines of, you know, bits and things that I kind of scribbled around and stuff like that. But I had to really work them out. And um, and then I went to an open mic the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. And this is now, you know, months before March when this is going to go on. And um, I picked a local open mic here in Grand Rapids, and there's a, there's two, at least two, almost every night of the week. You can, there's lots of places to work here. It's not a bringer show. You just show up, 
It doesn't cost you anything. It's great. And we have a, a pro club and an improv club. And it's just, it's a wonderful community, a great place to work out comedy. And um, I uh, went to this open mic and found out that, oh, I'm the only one who works clean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I had made a decision, you know, already at that point that I was going to work clean simply because the most important thing about doing comedy is being authentic. Now, there are certainly times in my life when I express myself through um, foul language. Uh, if I stub my toe, right. I'm, I might use a variety of colorful uh, metaphors, but that's I don't use it as a filler word. I don't use it as an adjective. I don't use it as just my everyday walking around. And since I'm not one of those high energy, woo, you know, running around like crazy Robin Williams style comedians, I'm much more contemplative and thoughtful and you know hey have you ever looked at it this way kind of yeah. thing um like there's i'm not going to be angry on stage i'm not going to stub my toe on stage so there's no reason for me to swear so i i haven't ever done it and then i then it just becomes like well i i wouldn't talk about those body parts in in polite company and i wouldn't you know i wouldn't yeah. i wouldn't i wouldn't so so i'm not going to do it here whereas I love all that kind of comedy. Right. Same. Some of my favorite comedians are, you know, just absolutely filthy. Um, we uh, we have a, um, a sporting goods store. It's a national chain of sporting goods stores. Um, and uh, I made a joke about it the other, uh, at an open mic recently, just because there were some comics in the room who are all like really, really dirty. And they always tell me like, oh, you're so clean. You're so clean. You're so clean. And uh, and so I made a joke about the sporting goods store, and that sporting goods store, of course, is Dicks. And right. and my yeah, so I made a Dicks joke. Yeah, and and you know that's that's kind of the edgiest I get with language or body parts or things like that. But my comedy is dark, um, so it's um, it, it's clean, but. There are some grown, there are some uncomfortable, there's some, oh gosh, did he really say, you know, it's tension building and so on. Right. Um, and uh, so after doing uh, that one open mic and finding out, oh, I'm the only one in town working clean, I, I wasn't, but but close. Um, I, you know, had to think more about what I was going to do and what was going to work. And I, I basically trashed that uh, set that I'd written and started working on something else to do that that first time at the first timer showcase. And then that was the the next time I I did stand up. And I've been doing everything from open mics to corporate shows to clubs to um oh gosh, just you know, whatever as as much stage time as I can eat since then. And that's been um uh, just a little over five years. Wow. Um, but then if you you know go back to oh, I worked in radio for a while and I did this and this. I have a a lifetime of performing, um, but not doing stand up. So the stand up part is the newest part. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah. A lot of community theater, but being on radio, being needing to be able to think on my feet, needing to be able to be comfortable talking in front of people. There is no place in the world I am more comfortable than on a stage. Um, right, and such is the curse of the extrovert. <laughs> Well, I mean, th those are all um, yeah. skills that you that helped you get ready for stand up, though, right? So all these little pieces over your life have helped you build up to that moment because no one truly go. And, and I know people go, "I've never, I, I've never done stand up. I don't know if I could do good." Well, you've uh -huh. you've talked to another human being before in your life. At least I thing hope one. so, right? That's thing one. <laughs> Words have come out of your mouth. You've formed sentences. Yeah. That's two, and you've probably written down something in your life. That's three yeah. things. Those three are the main skills you need to even do stand up. Right. So if you can do those three things, you can get started. Are you going to be great at it right away? No, you're not going to be, you know, Steve Martin. You're not going to be, you know, Bob Newhart. You're not going to be Eddie Murphy or Chris. Rock. You're not going to be any of those people, right. but that's OK. They weren't they weren't the great comedians, you know, now. Right. Day one when they walked, maybe Chappelle, but the rest of them when they walked <laughs> on stage wasn't weren't there yet. You know, it was yeah. like Chappelle's the only one I've ever heard of who's like, yeah, he's like 15 and like killing it already. And you're like, all right. Yeah, well, right. So. well, and there's and there's nobody who you know ever became great by becoming someone else right so you're it's not like you're gonna go be robin williams you're gonna be jerry seinfeld no 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 they were already be, them yep and and if you were to try to emulate what they were doing everybody would go like oh you're just doing an impression of yeah 
and 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 that's fascinating. It's interesting to watch. It worked for Steve Martin. Yeah. But <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> yeah. But it's not but it's not stand up. It's no. it's not your own stuff. It's not your voice as as we we often refer to, you know, what's going on inside of our heads and how it comes out. Uh, well, I think everybody does. Everybody does their own version of somebody in the beginning. They do their sure. mm-hmm. whoever their whoever their inspirational person is, or whoever yeah. they kind of associate with a lot. Mine was very much a Chris Rock thing. Like I really like Chris Rock's. Like kind of like mm-hmm. you know being being in the front. Like I never st- I never stand at the back of a stage ever. I always stand right at the front of a stage. Mm-hmm. I stand like right on right on there. And I used to pace a lot more. I don't anymore, but I used to. And so it was that very kind of aggressive, but I'm telling dad jokes, telling dad jokes in an aggressive <laughs> manner does not work. Okay. It's very, it's very unsettling yeah. for everyone involved. So, yeah. so it was one of those things where that was my style. But then I like, I, people want to say, Hey, you can't pace. First of all, that's really uncomfortable mm-hmm. and take a step back. Like, don't be so aggressive yeah. with, with, but I, but I watched Chris Rock. I grew up loving Chris Rock style. Obviously we're two different people. We're not even the same skin color or anything. <laughs> so I can't get away with 99% of the stuff you would say. Right. But I just wanted to, I, I really liked his his style of, of comedy. Right. And so it was very much the way I, I like to do. And he would tell family stories and growing up or whatever. So yeah. I was like, okay, this is what I like. But yeah, yeah who, did you have someone that you kind of emulated a little bit? Maybe that you emulated a little at the beginning? Yeah, for sure. Um, Steve Martin's album, um, it was, there was Let's Get Small and there was Wild and Crazy Guy. Uh, yep. Those are the first two records I bought for myself as a, like my own money right. kind of thing as a kid. And, you know, I have them memorized backwards and forwards. Um, and my my voice is kind of comes across similar to his. Yeah. Um, in his his um, guy who thinks he's in show business person, persona that he has. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't try to emulate that persona or things like that, but just my comic sensibilities are often to the absurd that uh, he does. So when I did the clean comedy challenge, that was a feedback that I got is like, you've, you've got some Steve Martin absurdity in you. And I was like, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Like, that, sure that that's, that's one true. of the albums that hangs over my desk. So I have, I go. have a couple of comedy albums that hang over my desk. I have Steve there. Martin's. Uh, let's get small. I have a button down. Uh, mine, Bob Newhart. Yep. Eddie Murphy, comedian. And then my my yep. favorite, my favorite, my who oh. should have been my dad probably yeah. was my dad in real life, <laughs> Rodney Dangerfield. Uh, oh. <laughs> no respect. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he'd my real father somewhere. And like oh, I just, wow. yeah, uh, would it be my guess? Because I I love <laughs> Rodney. Like that for me. I don't know. He's like my spirit animal. That's how I'm gonna be when I'm old. Like I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And I I certainly. I listened to a lot of stuff. I mean, um, you know, Bill Cosby's back touring again. Um, Is he really? Yeah. Or trying. Oh, wow. Yeah. He, uh, um, he he was, he was what there was before Steve Martin for me. Um, And it was like, oh, people had his album and I listened to, you know, different ones and I had those memorized. Um, And then after Steve Martin, it was um, Robin Williams and, and then I found out about Money Python, okay. which is another whole level of absurdity. Yep. Um, and um, and then just the AGM, Eddie Murphy, absolutely, he was there, um, and uh, you know had those albums and listened to those all the time. Were you a Richard Pryor fan at all? You listened to Richard Pryor at all? Uh, yeah, not not to the degree that I did to the, the other people that I mentioned. Um, right. Uh, simply because you know his albums had explicit language on it and stuff yeah. like that and that wasn't going to fly at my parents house. I, yeah <laughs> um but i did have uh a um uh a like a tape of an album of george carlin and they had taken out the track of the seven dirty words why that's the best one right, <laughs> right? because they're like oh no we you know you know we hear that right Jeez. And then I get in to start working in radio in the in the early 1980s. And, uh, you know, kind of like the first thing they sit you down with, I say, okay, so there's a bunch of words you can't say on the air. And so we're going to play and they drop the needle on the record. And I'm like, what? And I didn't know. And that's how I found about the Federal <laughs> Communications Act of 1973. Um, yep. <laughs> 
which I'm I mean, pretty sure honestly, that's how, how most people back in the day yeah. learned that there was an act of yeah. things that you cannot say on TV. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um and and then it but I thought his um the preciseness of his language uh was important. I loved Gallagher again for the language. I never got to I never got to see him. I wish I would have yeah. I wish I would have seen him. I, I actually I did. I was uh just beyond the splash zone. Oh wow. Uh, but I did have a poncho. Um so I was sitting close enough for that. Um, yeah, um, uh, that's that's certainly my era. And then later, um, you know, Brian Regan and Jim Gaffigan and Nate oh. Bargatze and and so on. Um, they're they're all. And I I feel badly about naming um, all men. It's right. a very male dominated uh, world of comedy for sure. But it's also it's for me it's the voice in my head it's the voice um it's not that i don't find female comedians funny i do i love female comedians but i don't hear their voice echoing in my head the way i do with the male ones so when i've got those tracks playing in my head the women comedians are very funny and i laugh and i love i'm um i'm excited I, i've got some tickets uh for for later this month to to go see some some comedians and um, I have good friends who are comedians and and are women, um, but but their jokes don't fill my head in the same way. And it's not because of the joke; it's because of the voice. Right, right. And, Do you know what voice like, I used to hear when I was a kid when I got in trouble before <laughs> I heard my mom's? I would hear Roseanne Barr's voice in my head because I used to watch. That show. She was like my TV mom, and yeah. like literally, I would hear her voice when I did something, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" And so oh, I could great. I could hear her voice like. If I said, sure. well, yeah, she was just yeah. always my mom. So I was like, and it's funny. She was just on something Kimmel yeah. or Fallon or something recently or whatever. And I, oh. I just, I literally, someone had it on in the background and I heard her yeah. voice and I was like, is yeah. my mom here? Like, it was yeah, that moment yeah, of like, sure, oh, sure. I know this voice. It's like terrifying <laughs> yeah. at the same time as like comforting to me, which I know people have beef with <laughs> Roseanne and whatever and stuff. It is whatever it is. Just, what, it is what I it is. Imagine anything about Roseanne Barr's voice being comforting. <laughs> it, well, because this because is she, why animals in the wild yeah. eat their young. Yeah. I mean, yes, but it is one of those things like if like you, have you've met people's parents where the mom, you hear the mom's voice and you go, I could not imagine listening to that every day, but that oh. kid has heard it every day yeah. and it is comforting to them, right? There's, that maybe the high nasally comfort. voice or whatever it is. And so watching Roseanne as a kid, I watched that growing up and very much that was like, I was a poor kid. I could understand where they were coming from sure. and, and the things that she would say to her kids and whatever were things that like resonated with me. Like, Oh, okay. Right. This is very helpful. And so there was a lot of respect there. And then again, Rodney Dangerfield as a kid was one there of those other voices that I heard. Yeah. And I, but, and I grew up with those two voices a lot of times right. in my head or answering things or responding to things. And so, yeah, that's a great, those are two yeah. great voices that kids should be having in their head, right. by the way. But I, um, I love, I wish Cosby, I mean, besides what's, what happened, yeah. I grew up on Cosby albums too. And I still own, I think I still ha I'll have them somewhere. You haven't thrown I had, them like, away. Every single, yeah. No, I haven't thrown them away. Just because I was like, <laughs> I spent money yeah. on them. You know, I'm like, and, they're, and, and they're funny, you know, ch chocolate cake was always a thing that I yeah. like love. Funny's funny. So, yeah, funny's funny. That's weird that he's on tour again though. Yeah, I right. Um, That's dicey, bro. <laughs> uh, uh, I started saying I have, I'm excited to have tickets that I've I've got coming up. I'm going to see mm -hmm. uh, Taylor Tomlinson. Yeah, and I'm I am in awe of her for awesome. multiple reasons. How prolific she is as a writer at mm -hmm. her age, I could say as a qualifier, but that's not it. It's as a person. Person, yeah, just a person who can crank material out like that, and it's all brilliant. It's so funny. She just she's not a voice I hear in my head, but her material is right in my heart. Um, yeah. And she's not clean, but she's, she got, used to be. Yeah. She's got, you know, she started out doing church comedy. Yeah. Um, and, and then the, the cruise ships and everything. Um, but, um, but her, the reality of her, of her life is, is such that like, well, yeah, the clean doesn't, isn't going to be the only thing that defines her. She's perfectly capable. It doesn't need of course. to. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, she so, has, she so, definitely has layers. She definitely has layers. That's that's <laughs> yeah. So those are those are um, you know from voices in my head to different comics who influenced me to you know who I listened to at the beginning and and still do. Um, uh, I I would love to say 
that I could someday, you know, I, there, I've heard enough comedy, but I don't think I'll ever get there. Yeah, I don't. I always continually watch stuff. I just watched Rhonda Corey's thing uh, the other yep. day. Like I, I watch everybody's stuff because I'm like, there's, even though I have my own voice and my own stuff, I always feel like I can learn something from everybody, yep. right? If I can yep. just watch and go, oh, that's so smart how they did that. I have this joke that's similar. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I can mm -hmm. rewrite it to have a better yeah. punchline because my punchline is good. It works, right? You can, we can always go, oh, it works. But yeah. you want to go, oh, I want it to be better. I want it to be as good as that punchline yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. How do I, how do I get there? You know, and, and Robert G. Lee is one of those people who constantly pushes us to do yeah. that too, right? He's like, yeah, that's yeah. great. That's a funny line. You, you're right. And. That's very funny. But, or, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Da, da, da. And. and you're like, ah, oh, dang it. You yeah, know, yeah, right. sometimes you go, I, I think I have this one. He goes, all right, yeah. that was good. It was very good. I like it. <laughs> But yeah. or and, and yeah, you're like yeah, ah, yeah. here we go here it goes. <laughs> um, go. I um, Haas Ridgeway's uh, dry Hoss bar Ridgeway. just came out today or or yesterday, and I yeah watched, it's it's on my list. I was listening to it, and I've seen him in person and so on, and and he and I have, have talked quite a bit. Um, and he gave me a really nice tag on a bit uh, that I do that still still works. Um, oh, nice, really well. Um. I, I did it in a show that I did uh, Saturday that, and it, it's such a great tag. Um, Cause I've, you know, I've got it. It's, it's not the punchline. It's just another piece of it that you string out. Um, but uh, every time I think, I think of Haas and so on. And um, oh, that's yeah. the thing is I thought, I thought of you because when I did that joke, right. When I did the joke, I talk mm -hmm. about the wedding dress. Right. And it was, it was a uh, sweetheart neckline, empire yeah. waist, a line <laughs> skirt, right? And it killed, right? Because ladies in the room I know all of those things, right? <laughs> ladies in the room went nuts for that because they're like, "Oh, he knows stuff. He's not just he's, being a more." It's so good. Our language, yeah, it was so good. Those good. three, just those three things, they were like, "Ah, right," because yep. I'm bashing, uh, basically bashing this show. And then yes. turn around and go, this is why, because yeah. we know she can't pull off a sweetheart neckline, <laughs> empire waist, and an A-line skirt. And they're like, <laughs> yep. I was like, this is yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So. That's awesome. I'm so <laughs> glad that worked out. Yeah. It was so oh, good. Great. I was like, that's, and I knew, I knew the moment that I did it, because I had done it a week before um, at another show with uh, John DeResta as the headliner. And it was, it was kind of sloppy. Like I was a little sloppy in delivery. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I went back and let's do it again and again. And I was like, okay, I have too many words here. You know, sometimes like, when oh, you yeah. write it or when you're oh, doing yeah. it, you think like, okay, this is good. But then you realize there's too many words in this and I'm not going to get those out in a <laughs> coherent manner. For sure. So I went back and worked on it. And then I went and did it again on, it was, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday night. And as soon as those three words dropped out of my mouth, that yeah. room just went, I was like, okay, well, that was Yo, great. That, that works. That's yeah. great. And oh. I did it on Saturday. I did it, but it was because it was kind of like, Tonky, they got, I got yeah. last and it was great. Yeah. But I was like, this this needs work. It's still not there yeah. yet. And keep in mind that joke's only what two weeks old, whatever, right. two, right. two or three. It's not even that old. So it's like it's like we're still matching it here. But I'm I'm there. Like it's it's 90% done now. It's like, okay, great, yeah. here we go. And yeah, they 90% wrote... it toward being something that you include regularly. Yeah. And 50% of the way to being where it's gonna be someday. <laughs> yeah, I think. Well, I think. I think. I, I think being there already, it's probably seventy percent of like being the. No, man, it's sixty-five percent. I swear. <laughs> Complete joke. Complete Don't joke. You... But, but it's one of those jokes that I'm going to keep putting it, slotting in all the yeah. time, and it yeah. goes really well with another joke of mine I have about my daughter's names and stuff. So we're talking about girly stuff, and I talk a lot about girly yeah. stuff, and so that slides in well, and it's just so funny because, and also talking about. Uh, I think I re I rewrote the ending of it because I had an ending about crying and a, whatever. I said in Texas, this is how we're taught to cry as a man, and this is how I cry now, right? And so yeah. two different ways of doing it, and so it's very <laughs> funny because people can see the Texas way of doing it. Go get in your truck, put on your sunglasses, crank up Garth Brooks, right, and cry your heart out, right? That's how you do it. Right. But but now Alone. I don't live in Texas, and I, yeah, Alone. and I don't have a truck, so I just <laughs> have to wait till everybody gets home. And then I just turn on Young and the Restless, right? And this boom, that's another laugh. I was like, they're they're happy. With it. So it's yeah. good. Like those moments of doing that is is what works. And I think my original ending had the had like doing the crying of the truck, but it wasn't strong enough because it wasn't like this big, big twist between the two. And that was something that, that you and Robert both said. Like there has to be more at this ending piece to get everybody to to yeah. laugh at it, and it yeah. worked perfectly. Now you started later because I also yes. started later. Yeah, is. Is there was one piece of advice you could give yourself 
If you like go back in time at the time <laughs> you're starting and say, Hey, Brian, do X, Y, and Z. What sure. would that thing be? Yeah. Don't start later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Besides, like, besides yeah. also more time well, travel. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So, so first, I mean, if, if I could go back and give myself advice, I would, I would say you're, back you're in your twenties. Um, yeah. Get, get her done. Start, start doing yeah. something with it. Do more. Cause I had that foothold in the door hosting while I was on the radio and I should have pushed it more picked up more found the books found the classes to to help me understand the structures and um i love the term toolbox that as yeah. as comics we have a toolbox and not everything is a hammer <laughs> you know not yeah. everything is a nail it's not always a hammer so it's like sometimes you need a subtle one sometimes you need it but each tool serves a purpose and when you approach your set with the multiplicity of tools that you have in your toolbox you get a more well-rounded set. The audience responds better because you're not giving them a monotonous flow of joke yep. types. Um, so it's always got to have some kind of twist. But then what? Then, you know, how do you tag it? How do you how do you keep keep it going? And then do you call it back later? And um, so the first first thing would be like get started, learn the tools sooner, and and do that. But then. Um, uh, even starting at age 50, uh, I would uh, say to myself at age 50, say, okay, don't wait more. <laughs> I would, um, uh, and because I didn't get into the real structures. I mean, I I, I took the master class, Steve Martin's master class, and I had a, a general understanding of the, the tools, but I would have uh, gotten... Um, the comedy Bible sooner. I would have right. gone through that. I have it. Oh, um, so nice. if you're, if you're a, a thinking about doing comedy or you are doing comedy and this is not in your arsenal, get it. I've got yep. some notes in it and stuff. Um, I have, I have both versions of the original, oh, the OG version and the see, new one. There you go. Yeah. 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 I, um, I probably buy comedy books every week. I don't know oh. why I don't, I don't like need, need yeah. them, but I like, <laughs> I'm like, I just want to read and see somebody else's point yeah. of view and well, yeah. how it's going to help. Like, yeah. and I'm um, partially just the way my brain processes information. I'm <laughs> not great on reading a book and then coming away with, with something. Um, right. So what I've found is um, with uh, Judy Carter's comedy Bible, because I had Steve Martin's master class in my head and I had Robert G. Lee's class in my head, that going to the the Bible then, the Bible, the, the comedy Bible, um, <laughs> then it was right, right. It was like going through my notes yep. and saying, right, that's it. Oh, here are some other things. And then working those, uh, that that's been extraordinarily helpful. But like, when it comes to reading, just reading in general, I, I do audiobooks mostly um, because as an extrovert, my brain often processes information. I'm an auditory learner yeah. and so on. So I get a lot more out of it that way than I do <laughs> on the page or or um or something like that. So um there was yeah, a so... there's a, another book. It's Polly Shore's sister. I think her name's Sandy Shore. Mm -hmm. She used to teach a comedy class at the uh, at the comedy store in, yeah. in LA, and but, she had a book that you could buy. Polly's mother, my, <laughs> yeah. Well, Polly's mother was Mitzi, but yeah. but Sandy was her was a Sandy sister. Was sister, yeah. And she would teach a comedy store class, and I never got to go to her class, but I bought. I remember buying her book online before she passed away, and I was like, "Oh, I'm going to take her class," and then she passed away, so I never got to take her class. But it was like it that book. If you can ever find a copy of that book is fantastic okay. because it, it makes you go through all these writing pieces and really works. Mm -hmm. It's a, a thick book. It's a workbook and whatever. I've never written in it. I, every time I do it, I just go through yeah. and write new stuff on my, cause I can't, I, Get I'm not, yeah. well, I got smacked as a kid for writing in books. So I like, I can't, <laughs> I, I like, for some reason, I feel like somebody's going to pop out and slap me again. So I'm like, yeah. don't write in a book, James. So it, that's, but yeah. I wish I knew what the name of the book was. I, it's happened to my stuff over here. It's one yeah, of the sure. few physical books that I own because I right. always buy digital books because I'm not allowed to have any more books. <laughs> my wife gets mad. Too yeah. many. Too many. I, oh, 
Oh, I had too many. Well, because, you know, I have, I don't know if you know this, but I have a, a bachelor's and a master's in history. So I like a million history books. And I was preparing to go to law school. So I had a million law books. Sure. And then I ended up going to business school. So I have a million business books. And then my mm-hmm. wife was like, you have, you, you have too many. What are you, you doing gotta, right now? No, you're done. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's. Yeah. So uh, I was a history major there for a minute. Um, and, and I. You're I smarter love, and got out of it. I love history. <laughs> um, and I, for me, it was. Um, what are the career paths to getting a degree in history? Good thing you're smart. Teaching, <laughs> his, teaching history. Oh, I think I would enjoy the classroom experience of teaching, but I wouldn't enjoy the rest of the teaching experience, the, the students. prep, the grading, <laughs> the students, the, all the stuff. It's, if it were simply like show up every day and there's an audience and I'm just going to talk about history. Great. That sounds wonderful, but that's a small part of the day for a teacher or professor or what have you. See, here's the here's what here's where you got it wrong. This <laughs> is what's great about it, okay? Because I still want to teach at some point. I probably will go back and get a PhD at some point. And I do, okay. I totally I love history. I do want to teach it. Well, here's what you do. History doesn't change, right? Nothing's right. gonna change about the Civil War. That's gonna change about the American Revolution. None of those things. Those are those are my yeah. my bread and butter. You write all the tests, you get it done the first year. Your first year is the hard one. And then after that, then you get to do all the fun stuff of just teaching and handing out the tests. And you know what they, you know what I'm saying? Then you're done. That's yeah. it. You scantron it back and you're you're out. Or oh. digital test online and you're done. You know yeah, what I'm saying? You don't I, have to do any any of the work. That's That was my thought process. It's like the I've, first year is the hard one. wrong all this time. Yeah. <laughs> now, I would, I would yeah. never teach like elementary or middle school or anything. It would be high, have to be high school or college. I can't yeah. teach. Yeah. Know, down or whatever that would not be fun for me yeah. and i would also like to do come dressed up as different people in history and like show props because oh, i gosh. have like <laughs> i have like civil war money and american revolutionary money like i would love to come in like dress like abraham lincoln and give the gettysburg yep. address you know or something like this that this is or, fast times at ridgemont high is what you're talking about yeah 100 percent. Right? <laughs> it is it really is it really is it's really you know it's bill and ted like i would want to do that uh-huh. like let's sure. let's make let's make it fun you know and sure. so there yeah it would be I love history. It's one of those things where I'm just like, I, if I, again, if I agree with you, if you just come yeah. in and talk, let's talk history let's do that. or yeah. whatever, then yeah, well, let's hundred percent do yeah. that. Now the radio thing you said you did yeah, in the yeah. high school. So they have yep. like a high school radio thing, like yeah, a like high school, you... high school radio station. Um, you could take a class and then you could be on the radio. And, um, and so wow. I did that. And then I, um, uh, later on I went to, um, a uh, broadcasting trade school, the Spex okay. Howard School of Broadcast Arts, and um, and there was you know a class there. They it's radio and television communications. It's you know trade school, some college credit for that, and so on. Um, but I knew like what I really need is a studio where I can work out my next demo tape, and then have some connections so I can uh, get this uh, over to some radio stations, so on. And yeah, my first job out of that school was uh, working news um, at a uh, uh, working overnight news. So I would do um, a short newscast at the top of the hour and then hand it over to the network feed, which would play the Larry King show. And then get to the bottom of the hour and I would do another short newscast, pitch it back to the network and do it. And I'd play commercials throughout it. So a glorified board operator, but writing news all night long and getting stories ready for the morning news guy who was you know this great icon of of radio who was you know close to retirement but was you know still had his foot hanging on there. yeah um wait did you have I, to write all the did you have to yeah. write all the news out like so you had to see like yeah. you had to be Type reading writer. the news or looking oh and they didn't have the internet right yet so how did you get did updates not. on news yeah how did you get updates so, on news uh the newspaper okay <laughs> came to our door uh, between two and three in the morning and I would go outside to the parking lot and pick it up, bring it inside and look for stories with a local angle and that kind of thing. And then I would rewrite it. The other thing that I did all the time um, is uh, a a few times throughout the night, I would uh, pick up a telephone (laughs) and, (laughs) and, and dial um, the local police departments, fire departments and things like that and say, I'd identify myself they knew that uh, I I was calling. They knew who I was, and um, and then uh, and and then I would you know find out what was going on. And um, there were there are two things that I remember so much about that time. Is one is um, 
the sheriff's department near me. So this was uh, in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area, Washtenaw okay. County. The Washtenaw County Sheriff's Department, the, the guy who answered the phone, his name was Harley Ryder. Love it. Yes! Such a fantastic name. That's an awesome name. Motorcycle cop? He was, no. but not anymore. Oh, he was! He was! Yeah, yes! He was at one point, you know. Um, and then um, the other was uh, the um, my car that I drove at the time had a um, uh, some kind of short in some wiring. And I went into the radio station for my 11 p.m. shift, and I was going to come back out at around 2 or 3 to get the newspaper, go back inside, and then leave sometime shortly after 6 a.m. Uh, to go on to my day job, um, which was miserable. But uh, I went out there at, uh, at uh, 2 or 3 in the morning, and my car was on fire. Oh, on geez. fire in the parking lot. And like I said, it had some kind of short in the wiring or something they figured out. But then I went back inside, and I called... The fire department <laughs> that I call every night and they answer and I'm like, hi, this is Brian up at the radio station. Oh, hey, Brian, nothing to report right now. No, no, no. I'm reporting. I'm reporting now. <laughs> My <laughs> car is on fire in the parking lot. Oh, oh, we'll be right there. Yep. <laughs> and they, so they came up the road and it, it wasn't far away and everything. And they put the fire out and everything. And the car was, you know, a complete loss. The tires exploded. It was, Whoa. It was you know, they, they swell up from the heat and... <laughs> Yeah. Did you write a report on your car exploding I in the parking sure, lot and then do it? Not only did I write a story, I took a uh, little portable re uh, recording um, deck out into the parking lot and interviewed. Uh, <laughs> like, so, yeah. So, and so I had to write it for myself, but then I had to write it into third person. Right. You know, radio station, uh, news personality, Brian, you know, you know his car caught fire and you know it's under investigation and you know and it was <laughs> and a couple of days later they're like yeah we found the start of it was underneath the driver's seat with the wire that went to the trunk and oh it was gosh it had uh it had sparked at some point so it sat there smoldering until it got a little oxygen and then gone yeah wow super, super crazy um what kind of car was it oh uh I know it's not may not be relevant to the rest of you, but no, I, no, no. I, it's, uh, it was uh, like a 1980, I want to say 82 Buick Skyhawk. Oh, okay. So it was the like, you know, think like Honda Civic sized yeah. Buick. They were like, oh, we got to make these smaller and get better gas mileage. And I uh, it was the first car I had that had um, power locks. Oh, wow. Um but it still had uh, crank windows. <laughs> yeah. But had power I, had a, locks, which was cool. I think it was a 1971 or 72 Volkswagen Super Beetle. Mm. And, uh, and if you know, if you know about those or Volkswagen bugs in, in, yeah. in, at all in the back seat is where the battery is. Yep. And so you, I, one time I tried to jump it, but I connected one of the cables to the rail in the back, but there's yeah. also carpet there. Yeah. And the other one to the or, battery or... and my whole back seat, Caught on fire, like oh gosh, and I had to like I was like fighting to put it out. But also, I was trying to jump. Like, I was like chaos. Yeah, I was like this, sixteen. It was so stupid. And this <laughs> is why when the kids these days say, "Oh man, that show was fire," I'm like, "No, no, it was not. No, <laughs> no that is that's never a term I'm going to use. Yeah, and feel good know. about. You know, it's like that's eh, just too much. Yeah, uh, yeah. Don't so you know, I went from there to a bunch of different formats different music formats i did country for a number of years i was a top 40 dj for a while i worked at um like a classic rock station um and uh that station had in a studio uh, in the same building had a um like an adult contemporary e easy listening kind of station yeah. um and i would sure. record um drops th that would play throughout the day so i would do a, like, hey, the weather's going to be great this week, you know, and give a, like a real generic weather forecast. Uh, and then um, uh, different things, different pieces of information and stuff, record all of that. And then I would be out in my car and I could listen to the station and hear myself on the air because <laughs> it was all being played back on delay. So I was just in the studio recording, 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 recording. And and that would all be automated. And, and there's a lot of stations that do that now, but that was a very early um, 
uh, early '90s uh, Ra- solution. Radio's kind of dying though now, right? Like, is it like like regular Don't tell local? Anybody. I, I'm not. I'm yeah. not. I'm just. Yeah, right. I, listen, I wanted to be the radio guy. I loved yeah. like the radio guy. I think yeah. that was awesome. It was like one of my favorites. But I feel like nobody listens. I don't. I don't listen to radio in my right. car anymore. Yeah. I mean, it, I I don't know very many people that do. It's podcast yeah. or mm-hmm. like what I use yeah. Apple, but like Spotify right. or whatever is what my kids yeah, yeah. listen to and stuff. So there's no. Yeah. What What's happening with that stuff? Right. Yeah. So I listen to um, I listen to NPR. Because I because okay. I love the talking, so it's all about voices to me. It's always going to be right. about voices. I love music. Don't get me wrong, um, but I kind of have all the music that I want to listen to. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So when I listen to music, I plug my phone yeah. in and and listen to that, or I stream that to you know Bluetooth around the house or whatever. But um, yeah, I don't even have a. Somebody sent me a link to a Spotify song today. I don't even have a Spotify account. I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. Actually, my kids do. I don't. Yeah, I don't have sure. one. Yeah, yeah, I don't. Uh, my I wife don't has a Pandora that. account, and she she likes that. Um, and um, so when it comes to radio, I think there's there's always going to be uh, a, a couple of things about radio that are, are going to make sense. One is going to be, um, is it local? Uh, right. do, do you do you get news information, topics, things like that that are unique to where you are now? Right. As more and more stations do um, syndication and they remove the local, they will make themselves irrelevant. And yeah. I've seen seen that happen here with with certain stations in in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I live. Um, th- the other thing that it used to be used to say, "Oh, there's no other format that can reach you in your car because you listen to your radio in the car. Maybe you don't even listen to the radio at home. You've got your television at home. There was newspapers there." a variety of different things um but now with streaming the way it is um, it's that but the the radio stations that are continuing to be successful are going to do local are going to do streaming they're they're going bob and tom show does yeah they're they're gonna they're gonna do things that make sense like that um but if they pull the local it's just a matter of time before it's just like well then it's just so generic yeah. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't ever have a relationship. And we know from comedy, um, it's all about the relationship with the audience. You're, you're having yeah. a conversation. You're there to talk with them for them to get to know you. Um, people, uh, called into the radio station. People came out to meet me when I was broadcasting at a, at an event somewhere. And, you know, and of course everybody says, you don't look like your voice. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what what my voice is supposed to look like but yeah um the uh the idea that um that radio is dying is like well if it keeps doing certain things and stops doing certain things then yeah then what do we do with those airwaves what do we do with those devices um yeah becomes a question um there's still advertising money to be made there's still you know there's still businesses but um, you know, when radio got started, it was not a financially successful thing because they people hadn't figured out what to do with it. Um, right. And then it was like, oh, well, we're going to put these things on the air. We're going to put news on the air. We're going to put sports on the air. We're going to do those things. And as you, you know, have ridden that bell curve and now it's, you know, dwindling, um, I, I think it's just what I think. I'm not an expert on this. Um, I think that the more they lean into local things, those local radio stations that are there, right? You don't need a studio anymore. I mean, this is I'm, I'm at home, yeah. You know, and I could stream from here. Right. Um. So you know, you you can have, you know, even if the DJs, you know, or personalities, or whatever, are just, um, getting local information that somebody is pu- putting together, um they themselves or whatever and it's doing something local then you're going to have a local following and it's it's you're not going to be a star you're not going to be you know you're not going to make a big pile of money or anything like that but but it it will you know potentially still remain like that but yeah i'd hate to see it just... yeah and that's not i mean that's not necessarily needed anymore i mean i think there's that that theory that if you have a thousand true fans you can make a living doing anything right so you have a <laughs> sure, thousand, right? Thousand... 
I mean, that's, that's a theory, right? A thousand yeah. true fans paying a hundred dollars a year or something like that, or whatever you right. can make, you can make a living or whatever. And that's, yeah, that's for sure. that there's, it's highly possible. So I think that's doing it. Do you think that um, podcast like become the new rate, like new radio style thing? Do you think that's the way it's going to go? Or do you think podcasts are just going to stay in the stream of eBooks or things on demand yeah. type, type world that we're I, in? So I listen to a ton of podcasts. I do too. I usually, yeah. um, so it's uh, some people listen to music all day right. while they're working and stuff like that. And my day job, I listen to podcasts all day. Yeah. I listen to a lot of comedy podcasts, but I also listen to a lot of news and finance and, and you know, because yep. I don't want to know only about one thing. I want to learn as much as I can about as much as I can. Um, so I, I, I listen to an awful lot of things. The thing that the podcasts have going for them is, first of all, it's topical. So it's here is a podcast about this. Yep. And just like a book, you have books that are about this thing and you have books that are about this thing. And some of them are nonfiction, some of them are fiction. And so when it comes to entertainment level, fiction ones, true crime and that kind of stuff are, are going to win in the entertainment um, venue. You know, documentaries get made all the time, but, you know, you rarely see them in your local movie theater, right? Um uh, you, you know, there's the National Geographic channel and there's other right. ways to, to watch these things or l- listen to these things. Um, but the topical things that podcasts bring of, um, you know, like we listen to a lot of comedy, but I listen to news and I listen to history and a variety yeah. of other things um, to have that be the a, a way to get that information and get it to you in a format that makes sense to you. And for me, audio is the format that makes the most sense to me. Right. Um, that's um, yeah, that's where I'm going to be. In fact, I would say that just to flip us back over to comedy and performing and stuff like that, the thing that I'm going to suffer with more than anything is act outs. Because while act outs are important and I can talk with my hands and I do and my face changes and I and I do things like that, um, because I worked in radio for so long, I think a lot of my comedy is you can listen to it and watch it and the difference is very minimal. Right. Um, so that may play well for me when I get an album out and, and send it to Spotify or, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's true because like, if you listen to some Brian Regan albums, like yeah. I, we love Brian Regan, a lot mm-hmm. of act outs, you can't, you can't, yeah. you're not able to see them. Yeah. You can hear something going on, but you don't know yeah. what's happening a hundred percent. And so it doesn't, I, I actually have noticed a lot more that a lot more comedians are doing less act outs because they yeah. know it's going to go to an audio format for people to listen right. to on an album. So they avoid yeah. act outs. I'm like, that's very interesting. That's a very interesting uh-huh. thought process of like, okay, yes, you might see it on Netflix, but also this is going to be an album that people are going to stream on their phone and listen to while they're driving or working out or whatever. Although also don't listen to comedy while you work out. I would <laughs> used to listen to comedy while I worked out and there's nothing weirder than a man <laughs> doing squats who just starts laughing out loud while he's like, yeah. it's so creepy. Everyone <laughs> in the gym's like, what is happening to this guy? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So don't, don't do that. Sure. Like, yeah. Listen to, listen to music, be a yeah. normal human being. Listen to music. <laughs> Great example of uh, <laughs> the um, the comedian who's um, doesn't do a ton of act outs that you yeah. see is Jim Gaffigan. So I just yeah. saw him here in Grand Rapids last week, and um, I was paying a lot of attention to how. So he's he's in a stadium, twelve thousand seat arena, and uh, he didn't move much. Yeah, he. He moved a little bit this way sure. and came back to center and came back to his mark. Um, another thing is uh, the screens in this in the stadiums, you know, used to be this, and now this yep. is how they are oriented. And you know, yep. they were, um, you know, sixty feet tall, um, uh, but they were in, in that orientation on either side of the stage. And they, the camera guys, didn't hardly have to do anything because he didn't yeah. move around too much. But his act outs are his voice it's yeah. that other voice that he's got that yeah the, you know, the the inside voice of the person in the audience or yeah. the person he's talking to of, of hey, whatever they're hey thinking. buddy what's wrong with mormons yeah that's always my favorite one. <laughs> does he now does he do, i last time i saw him he did yeah. a thing at the end so he does his own show he goes yeah. back and then he comes back out and he does the encore. encore he usually does like hot pockets yep. and a couple other things did he do that same thing he did not do an encore this time around oh wow um, yeah, uh, so I saw him a couple of years later, uh, uh, earlier. I saw him the week before lockdown started. Uh, oh, wow. 
here in Grand Rapids, and then he came back last week. Um, I saw Brian Regan. Um, he usually does encore too, or at least yeah, not, every time I've seen him, he does encore. Yeah, last time I saw him, he did an encore as well. Um, so yeah, um, you know, it's it's a thing that, um, and I think uh, I've heard other comics talk about this, and maybe you have as well. The idea of you know bands and musicians and stuff, people come to hear the songs that they know and they sing along and they talk, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of our natural instinct to say, well, you've heard that. Why do you want to hear yeah. it again or see it again or whatever? Um, and I always think of um, an interview John Cleese from Monty Python gave um, when he uh, went to, they did a live show. I think it might've been live at the Hollywood bowl. Okay. Um, that he was like, you know, what is, what is that sound? Um, as they were doing their sketches that people have been watching for years and heard on albums for years and so on, couldn't figure it out. And he peeked out between the curtain. He looked out into the audience and he could see the whole audience mouthing along with the words. They knew the material so well. And they were doing it with them and they wanted to be there to yeah. do that, to have that. And so I think, mean, yep. I'm not going to worry about whether somebody um, has already seen or already heard or whatever. I, I, you know, if they're coming to see me, it's because they've already heard it or already seen it. Yeah. And I, I want to make sure I bring them something new, but yeah, if, if I ever get to the point where it's appropriate for me to do an encore, you better believe I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you ever had this. I've done sets with people that have seen me before. And they go, hey, you didn't do this joke. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I don't always, I don't always do that joke. They're like, oh, really? You should do that joke. And I'm like, you should do that one. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. And yeah. I, and I knew, and I knew that people were actually paying attention one time where I did a set, and then uh, I came back and did another show like a couple weeks later at a place, yeah. and I knew, I knew somebody, people in the audience, and afterwards this kid came up to me, he goes, he goes, I love your bear joke. It's my favorite joke. <laughs> And I was like, oh my gosh, like, okay. So he, like, he repeated the whole joke back to me. And yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, okay. That's like, great. this is awesome. I like, yeah. I love that this, and I forget that we were told as comedians, don't repeat material. Like once you do it on a special, or once you have an yeah, album right. or whatever, it's burned and you can't do it and whatever, you know, so yeah. you whatever. But then you go, then as comedians, we think about like, oh man, this is one of my favorite jokes by so-and-so. And then like right. you, and you know that material. So it's yeah. weird that we, we, that we kind of ostracize we, comedians we, for the same thing bands do. We forget that we like to hear that material over and over too. Yeah. yeah. One, of, one of my best friends does a whole bit. He does a Celine Dion bit. And the way I met him, it like, because I hired him, I booked him on a show and I said, Hey, I just want, you know, I book you on the show. I think you're very funny, but I really want you to do th this bit. This is the specific bit I want you to do. <laughs> if you can do that bit. He's like, yeah, of course, or whatever. And yeah, then sure. I know of times where we've done shows together and he hasn't been able to close with that bit. And someone has come up, up to him after the show and say, hey, you didn't do this bit. And he's like, yeah, I couldn't do it because of X, Y, and Z. They're like, oh, yeah, man, right. was, I was so excited to see it. It's like, that is insane <laughs> to me. Like, That's nuts, and he couldn't yeah. do it on his, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it on his dry bar special. Like he couldn't do the bit that oh, I, that I yeah, talk yeah. about on his dry bar special. And people have watched it and literally message him and say, Hey, I've seen you do this bit. How come you didn't do it on dry bar? Uh -huh. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, dude, like yeah. that is insane where That's people great. know your material and they like know what, what they love about your material and you don't do it. And then they are feel like, yeah. well, I just wasted my time to come see you right. when you didn't do the right. thing I want. It's That's so, nice. I don't understand why we haven't got over that as comedians yet, yeah. you know, cause you know, Chocolate cake is one of my favorite Bill Cosby bits, you know, like King yeah. Tut's one of my favorite Steve Martin bits. If he came out and I saw the show and he didn't do King Tut or he didn't do a couple other things, <laughs> I'd be upset. Like I would be if, if Rodney Dangerfield came out and never did any, you know, jokes like I get no respect. If he never did, I get no respect yeah. uh, forever. I'd be upset. Right. And Rodney Dangerfield wrote that material forever. Like he, right. I don't think he ever changed that material. That's what he was, and that's what everybody knew. If he started coming out and had a whole new shtick a year later, people would be so mad. They're like, yeah, "You're yeah. the I get no respect guy," you know. So, right, it's super weird. What um, what are you? What are your goals? What you, goals do you have for your for your comedy career? Yeah. Like, what's on the horizon? What are the things that you want to accomplish and stuff? And sure. then, yeah, um, wrap it up here. I'm. Oh, well, let's not wrap it up. Let's just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have I'm, kids. I have to go take care of Brian. Oh, that's not yeah. fair. <laughs> Ugh. 
Um, I, I'm a responsible adult. Yeah. I um my my goals are rather informal. I'm not okay. a, a goal setter, goal accomplisher, checklist maker, checker offer. Oh. Um, but there's a few things. Um, okay. One one is um, I'm I'm at a stage in my comedy career or comedy life that I'm really just trying to get as much stage time as I can eat. It's just to do as absolutely much as I can and still be a good husband. Oh, there you so, go. That's the key. Yeah. So for me, um, comedy is, it's roughly once a week. It's okay. if I'm going to do, if I've got a week in a show. So this last weekend, I had a Friday night show at one place. And then uh, two shows on Saturday night somewhere else. Um, so you know it's Friday and Saturday night. That's unusual uh, right. to have to have me booked that much. So you know I talked with my wife. I did that. I so on. But then I didn't like even go hit an open mic this week. Right. Um, and then um, coming up in mid May, um, I've got uh, a weekend where I've got a Friday, Saturday, and then a Monday show. Um, and doing that, um, doing that, I got to make sure that I'm not um, trying to do too much later. Right. Um, you know, after that, um, that I'm, I'm not, you know, overbooking myself and not being present, present for, right. for my wife. Um, no. Um, as as we record this, uh, her birthday's tomorrow, uh, and so ha you know, happy early birthday. Well, that'll be late when this comes out. So sure, whatever. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she will probably have her birthday, and then um, uh, so I I gotta you know make sure that I'm not doing, you know, comedy on and around her birthday, and likewise yeah. for our wedding anniversary, which is uh, toward the end of May. Um, so not doing that. Um, but. Um, but she's extraordinarily supportive. Uh, she wants me to, uh, every time I go out the door, she says, have fun, be funny. Before I, I came in Aww. here to record this night, she says, have fun, be funny. I have a little page on my website where I you know, explain that because uh, it's, it's it's just a, a connection um, and how she supports me. Like but that's that. also a good reminder to, to comedians yeah. too, because a lot of times well, we go well, into it going, all right, let's, we got to have a great show. And instead yeah, of having right. fun, right. you're focused on like, oh, I, I, I got to do the best show possible. Yeah. And we forget this is supposed to be fun. So I do it. I do it myself. So go. I'm not yeah. I'm not knocking well, anybody. And that's and that's my biggest goal right there is that have fun. Yeah. Be funny. Because honestly, um, I'm I'm just at an age where unless something extraordinary happens, that, you know, getting discovered thing that happens to some people, right? Um. And now I see plenty of people who they're grinding out um, shows and and you know putting themselves through a ringer, and I see their family life suffering from that, yep. and still, you know, the success that they're having is still it's a modicum of success. It's it's not like they're making a living doing yep. this. Yeah, I'm I'm not at that point. Same, um, but uh, but what I do look at is because I started later is um i want to get to the point where when i retire from you know my regular work life um that i have this thing that i do that is a, an income stream for me that is the thing that i love to do uh i saw a um uh interview with jerry seinfeld recently uh, with uh, mark maron on mark maron's podcast where okay. he, they talked about um like you know is this are you ever going to stop doing this no why would I ever stop doing this? This, you know, this is what I do. This is what I love to do. It's like breathing. Um, Seth Meyer uh, just gave a um, Seth Myers, excuse me, just gave a uh, an interview. Uh, uh, it was with uh, with James Corden uh, on one of his last shows, saying, um, "Yeah, I hope I die at the late night desk." <laughs> uh, wow, not soon. But, no, 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 know, right? But yeah, that's dedication. When you when you've found the thing that you love to do and, and you're able to do it and you do it well and, and people pay you to do it. I mean, yeah. So, um, I, I have no ambitions about fishing. I have no, you know, desire to, you know, I live in Michigan. It's, it's like, well, there's hunting, there's fishing and there's drinking beer. That's what we've got. We're, <laughs> there's a lot of people who are really, really good at those things. 
Um, I get motion sick, so I'm not getting on a boat. Um, well, you know, uh, I can do cruise ship. I, so anybody, you know, cruise ships, I can go do that. Um, but, uh, but I, where I want to be is at the point where, um, I will be roughly 10 years in and there's that magic number of when you've been doing stand up for 10 years, that's how yeah. long it takes you to find your voice to really get good so that you're really starting to do things. Um, yeah. so about that time is kind of in that transition of phasing out a day job, phasing into, uh, you know, Retirement. what I'm, what I'm going to do later. So, um, that, that's a, you know, long-term goal. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to do a dry bar special. Um, I think, um, I'm getting closer to consistency, but because I'm only really doing this kind of once a week, there's only so consistent right. I can be. So it's, it's a lot of raw talent and a lot of, um, you know, individual hard work that I have to do to get there. Right. Um, and then, you know, I, I try to, you know, crank out, you know, go to open mics. I, I open mic is the gym. That's yep. where we go to work out so that we can play the sport yep. that we do. Um, yep. And if, um, so people who, um, you know, like all they ever see is you had an open mic. Um, all they've seen is you practice. Yeah. And yep. so uh, I, I tell people all the time, they're like, oh, we want to come see one of your shows. I say, well, the only thing I'm doing really around here is is open mics, and I've got my schedule for that. But there are other shows that I'm doing, but you'd have to travel a bit to to go to those. Um, but that's where you'd see me work. And right. the difference between watching me practice and watching me work, it's a big, big difference. Right. Um, it's so funny because people will pay to go see like NFL players practice or NBA players practice, right? Yeah. They'll pay they'll pay money to go see that. Yeah, they'll yeah. or even work out like we have the like yeah. Um, out here, the Dallas Cowboys come out and they do their, what is it called? Their, what is their preseason? Uh, sucking? Or no, I, that, I don't know. Yeah. No, no, but do? I don't know what it's called, but it's like, they're, they're That's like everything I know season. about the Dallas Cowboys. Um. <laughs> it's like their preseason <laughs> practice thing or whatever, but it's just like them coming out and working sure, out sure. and doing this stuff yeah. and people pay money to go camp. watch them like camp. Yes. Watch camp. them come do their camp. Yeah. And I'm like, why, why would you pay for that? Like hey, why? I mean, what world does that sound fun to you? Like I would not go, yeah. listen, I love watching baseball. I love baseball. Yes. I grew up on baseball. Yes. I would not go to watch them throw the ball at each other and practice like I used to practice when I play baseball. I would not yeah. pay that. I would be so mad. I yeah. want to see a game. Yeah. I want to see you know, competition. So it yeah. doesn't make any. I, I don't Even understand. if it's spring training. Yeah. Spring training is still not. Sure. It's like, yeah. Um, I would go if I could go play with them. If they would let me come on the field <laughs> and play, then I would go. Yeah. I would pay for that. Yeah. I would I, suck. I would suck yep. terribly, but I would go. do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard to explain to people. It's like, just because yeah. I'm somewhere performing doesn't mean that I want you to come. Yeah. Agreed. And, the, and the people who are running the shows, I apologize yeah. because you know, that's their whole thing is they're trying to drum up business for the bar that they're in or whatever. Nobody and, should. Okay. I, I'm going to yeah. say this here a million times. <laughs> Nobody should be one charging for an open mic for people nope. to come watch it because it's, you wouldn't charge somebody to come watch you work out in the gym. That would exactly. be creepy and weird. No, right? but this it's, is the it's the yeah. it's the drinks and the food and the you know. I agree. Then the, yeah. have the comedians do a one one item minimum or whatever and stuff like that yeah. and pay for it that way. That's fine. But don't don't have people come to an open yeah. mic because no. everyone knows everyone who's ever done stand up knows an open mic is the worst stuff you're ever going to hear any for other sure. human say on a stage yeah. in public. Yeah, and and like while they're most of the time while they're sober, which is terrifying right. sometimes. Right things you and hear a lot we of go times not yeah um, <laughs> sometimes not but you yeah. hear somebody say something you go you said that in public out yeah. loud in front of other humans sure on a microphone wow yeah. like what do yeah. you say in your private life <laughs> right well yeah and that's just it so uh yeah that's um but to get to the point where um i'm doing more professional shows than i'm doing open mics and i have months like that where i'm like oh i did three open mics and four pro shows. Yeah. Great. You know, those are always good to me. That's like, Oh, that's, I'm going to the gym and I'm playing the sport. Yep. Um, so that's, that's what it is. I think even, I mean, until I got to a point where it was just, I was just book, 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 book. Um, you know, that's the only reason I wouldn't do an open mic. Um, yeah. 
Um, I like the the community of of people that I've gotten to know through comedy. Uh, I enjoy spending time with them. Um, the um, uh, they're they're people who understand what you're trying to do, and and they will generously say, "Oh, I had an idea for the thing that you're doing." And so there's always, and sometimes it's absolutely great, and sometimes it's not, but it's it's always learning. Um, so yeah. Um, I yeah, like that. So yeah. All those, right. Those well, are my where, goals. where can people find you? Where can they find out where you are going to be on shows and all that kind of sure. stuff before they go to check you out? Yeah. Um, my uh website and social media presence is all at Brian A Comedian. So YouTube at Brian A Comedian, TikTok at Brian A Comedian, Instagram at Brian A Comedian, and uh Facebook. Um, and my website is Brian A Comedian.com. Um, and uh, on the website you can find uh there's a calendar with uh every show open mics and everything are all there um wow so i'm just like well i it's also kind of like how i keep track uh it's my own calendar <laughs> as Smart. well um but it also um you know from a uh website perspective search engine optimization it's it's a piece of content that's um yep generating traffic for me and uh search engines are, are grabbing hold of it so that's that's going well um uh videos are there so if people want to see uh videos if they want to see what what's going on with that um i just put up some new photos um nice. great, i'm gonna plug the photographer libby o photography uh took some photos at uh the wholehearted winery where i was on saturday two shows that were just wonderful audience was fantastic um i've got a little video from that as well but the photos that she took are, are some of the best photos people have taken of me while i'm performing so i put those on my website that's and, awesome um i've got old episodes of clean comedy time podcast and if we do yep. a new one <laughs> um and then uh you know and there's some other thoughts and things like that i was like okay yeah i work clean but my i don't market myself as a clean comedian right um, my hope is that i'm going to be so funny nobody's going to notice that i'm working clean right um, right. But it gets me in the door for places where they need it to be clean. Right. Uh, the tricky part is that um, there are people who think, oh, I don't want him because he's clean. Right. You know, so that's that's the line. So, yeah, I can work churches and I can and I don't market myself as a Christian comedian either. But I worked in ministry uh, for most of my adult life. So I have all these stories, uh, you know, church, parachurch, ministry type stuff. Um, that's all there. Um, but I don't promote myself that way. Um, yeah. and so I, I definitely work clean. I, I, uh, could certainly be classified as a Christian comedian. Um, but my goal is to be a comic. Um, there you go. and that, uh, and then Steve Martin's comment, uh, that is his advice from, uh, born standing up and, and he's repeated it a, a bunch of different places is be so good. They can't ignore yep. you. Yep. Barry, oh. Barry Katz says something similar. Be so good. They get you're undeniable. He's, yeah. So great. it's one, it's yeah. one of those perfect things. Well, thank yeah. you, Brian, so much for being on there. I want to put all his links in the show notes. So you guys can go check that out. Please go like and subscribe on YouTube. Please go like and subscribe, uh, follow on Instagram, go follow the, the podcast, follow his podcast and go listen to old episodes. Hopefully it'll come back. I can be on an episode and we'll be, we'll be hunky dory there. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening. Please have a good one. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye.